Good afternoon. It's Tuesday, February 21st, 2023. Welcome to Civil Justice Subcommittee. Thank you all for being here today. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Representatives Beck. Wolso. Here. Capley. Here. Eldridge. Here. Farmer. Here. Grills. Here. Lamberth. Parkinson. Todd. Here. And Chairman Russell. Here. <laughs> Chairman, you have a quorum. Uh, thank you. <laughs> All right, let's see if we can get this. Um, thank you, members. And do we have any personal orders? All right, not seeing each, any personal orders. Each week we start out by introducing two members to tell a little bit about themselves. And today we'll start with Chairman Farmer. Chairman Farmer, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Chairman Russell. My, na my name is Andrew Farmer. And I represent portions of Sevier and Jefferson County over in the 17th district in East Tennessee. I've served in the legislature. This is my 11th year. Started with, started with Leader Lambert, and I'm trying to see if there's anyone else on the committee that I started with. I don't see anyone. But uh, I, have, I have a wife, and I have two wonderful children at home. And uh, just uh, what an honor it is to serve here in the, in the General Assembly. And I've mostly served on the Judiciary Committees uh, a couple times. I've been able to serve on different ones. I've, I've served on the Insurance and Banking Committee and a state and then this year i also serve on the health committee as well so it is truly an honor to serve with every member here and work for all the tennesseans uh, that are watching and especially my constituents that i represent so thank you mr chair thank you chairman farmer and uh, one thing about chairman farmer he's been taking flying lessons and he and i fly quite a bit and he's always teaching me something in fact we landed today in madisonville and he says you know that propeller out there is just a big fan and I said, well, what do you mean? He says, if it stops turning, you're going to start sweating. So I guess he's right. <laughs> Chairman Todd, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate this opportunity. Uh, I'm Chris Todd. I represent District 73, which is most of Madison County. And uh, I have uh, been here, this is my fifth year, third term. Uh, so I still feel like I'm fairly new, uh, drinking from a fire hose almost every day. Uh, I uh, have a wife, and I don't see her in the room with me. She's uh, hanging around somewhere today, but uh, her name's Melissa. We have three kids, uh, all grown, college and, and above, and um, very proud to be in the legislature and serve with uh, such a, a great uh, body of individuals and represent such a great state uh, that, that we have. Uh, by trade, I'm an erosion control contractor in Madison County. We cover a pretty good size area in West Tennessee and beyond. Uh, providing erosion control and grassing services for contractors and developers. So uh, that's what I do for uh, my real job. But uh, proud to serve in this legislature. I serve as the chairman of the House Agriculture and Natural Resources Committee and serve obviously on civil justice and uh, education instruction, and calendar and rules. So very glad to be here and thank you, sir. Proud to serve beside you. Thank you, Chairman Todd, and it's an honor to serve beside you. And you came in in the best class, the class I came in also, so thank you. And uh, I don't know about the leader down there. <laughs> All right, we got a calendar today. It's uh, 13 items, and uh, without objection, we're going to take item number 9, House Bill 1158, off notice. We're going to go out of order and call up item number 3 first, House Bill 1189 by Representative Fritz. Do I have a motion? And we have a motion and a second. Uh, and Representative Fritz, you are recognized. And I do show an amendment. Would you like to attach that amendment? We got a motion and a second. Do you show an amendment code? Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. My amendment code is 004089. -er. And does that make the bill? This is an amendment that makes the bill, yes. Mr. Okay, Chairman. we'll be voting to add amendment 004089 to the bill. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, no. All right, the amendment, Abner, if you'll go ahead and then sort of address the bill as amended. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Um, the, this, the amendment uh, brings this bill to uh, greater alignment with the Federal Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act that we discussed when I, I brought the bill last week and we rolled it for the week. The exceptions in, included in the bill preserve the ability of our citizens to file legitimate claims against those that may be bad actors in this industry. Um, I will go into further reasons that we need this bill, uh, committee members and chairman, if you would like me to. At this moment, I'll pause and take any questions you have about the amendment itself or any of the language from last week. 
All right, members, we have any questions for Representative Fritz? All right, seeing none, we'll be voting on House Bill 1189 as amended to send us the civil poll. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes prevail. Civil poll. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, committee members. Thank you. Next up is item number one, House Bill 723 by Representative Holsley. We got a motion and a second. Do we have a Representative Holsley? And I do not seem so that uh, motion has been withdrawn and we will roll that to the hill. Road to the hill. Next up, item number two, HJR 38 by Representative Reedy. And we got a motion and a second. Representative Reedy, you are recognized and I do show an amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee. The amendment tracking number is 3864. That's got it. Well, that's what I got. Would you like to add that? Yes, it, that, it will make the bill. Okay. We're voting to add Amendment 003864 to House Joint Resolution 38. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, no. Amendment added. You're recognized. Uh, and, Representative and reading for the record proposes amending Article 1, Section 22 of the Constitution of Tennessee by removing the provisions that the legislature has the power to regulate the wearing of arms with a view to prevent crime and by clarifying that the citizens of the state have the right to keep, bear, and wear arms, which is currently consistent with the uh, constitutional carry laws of Tennessee. Thank you, Representative Reedy. Any questions for Representative Reedy? Questions been called. We're voting to send HJR 38 to civil four. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes prevail. Civil justice full. Thank you. Next up, item number four, House Bill 1080 by Representative Powell. We got a motion and a second. Representative Powell, you are recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee. Uh, this bill was brought to me actually by a uh, meteorologist here in Nashville um, trying to just make certainty. Um, other states have passed what's called a safer places law. And it just makes clear that uh, present law currently already does allow for a charitable organization to provide services to the community and make sure they're not liable uh, in terms of like an, a severe weather event. This would just make it clear that uh, these organizations um, can provide shelter during adverse weather and, and temporary uh, during severe storms. Thank you, Representative Powell. Any questions for Representative Powell? Seeing none, we're ready to vote on item number four, 1080. For Representative Powell, send the civil four. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes prevail. Civil four. Next up, Thanks, item, Chairman. Thank you. Next up, item number five, House Bill 985 by Representative Beck. And I do not see Representative Beck, so we'll row him to the hill. Next up, item number six, House Bill 395 by Representative Capley. We got a motion and a second. Representative Capley, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This bill was brought to me by TWRA, and after a rigorous selection process, they chose a young fellow from Lawrence County, Tennessee. Uh, basically, what this bill does, it seeks to bring several sections of Title 70 regarding wildlife resources in line with permitless carry changes made by our great General Assembly. Uh, these statutes affected either uh, have flat prohibitions or prohibitions subject to a handgun permit that no longer conform to the general state of handgun carrying in our state. HB 395 will reconcile Title 70 with the new landscape and provide clarity to sportsmen and the women of Tennessee. Basically what this does, Mr. Chairman, would eliminate the penalty for carrying uh, a handgun or sidearm uh, while in the process of bow hunting uh, throughout in the woods so Tennesseans can have greater access to safety while they are bow hunting. Thank you, Representative Capley. Any questions for Representative Capley? Yes, sir. Uh, Representative Parkinson, you're recognized. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, thank you, Representative, for bringing the bill. Uh, I had no idea you can't you can't have a sidearm with you while you're bow hunting. Representative Capley, under the current code, it would be a violation. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Thank you for the education. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, if I could, Representative Capley, you're just clarify. Uh, this would also basically the, the language says that you cannot use the handgun or firearm while in the process of bow hunting. So it's just strictly for safety. Thank you. Any questions for Representative Kepley? 
Seeing none, we're voting on item number six, House Bill 395, to send to civil four. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, no. Ayes prevail. Civil four. All right, members, without objection, we're going to reconsider our actions and take up item number one, House Bill 723 by Chairman Holsey. Do I have a motion and a second? We got a motion and a second. And uh, Chairman Holsey, you're recognized on House Bill 723. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, committee. Um, under existing law, and I, I don't know if it's just an oversight, a retired police officer, state officer, or federal officer can, can carry... Uh, while they're in an institution of higher learning, if they're working there full time. And uh, I don't know what the reason was for just specifically full time, but this, this bill changes that and says that you can, you can carry a handgun if you're working part time and you're a retired uh, officer with at least 20 years service and you retire in good standing. If that makes sense. We'll check and see. Any question for Representative or Chairman Halsey and Chairman Todd? Thank you. So I just a question for you. So, it, it, who else can carry on uh, these properties now? What other hired uh, employees can carry now? Chairman Halsey, I, I, I'm not positive, but I think uh, faculty can. They very well may have a system where they register with the with the institution, but I think they can. Uh, but the specific part of the bill I'm dealing with is it allowed retired officers, but they had to be full time. And uh, this just changes that to part time. But I, I think that's who can carry. Chairman Todd. I guess I just would ask, are we creating a separate class? I know this is extending it from full time to part time. But in, in doing this, are we creating a special class of people and setting them apart from the rest of population uh, from the standpoint of their Second Amendment rights. Chairman Hosey? We probably are. I was thinking there's another bill in the pike that will make this a moot point, but if it doesn't pass, I wanted to... Uh, there are lots of retired officers who are working part-time in, in that capacity, and, and they cannot carry at this time, but a full-time can. Chairman Todd? All right, we got any more questions for Chairman Hosey? Seeing none, we're voting on House Bill 723 to send to Civil 4. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes prevail. Civil 4. Thank you, Committee and Chairman. Thank you. Next up, item number 7, 1005 by Representative Grills. We got a motion and a second. And Chairman Grills. Chairman Todd is going to present this bill. And Chairman Todd, you are recognized, and I do show an amendment. Yes, sir. Drafting code 4255. Okay. That's what I got. We got a motion and a second on the amendment. Would you like to add it to the bill? Does it make the bill? Yes, sir. It does make the bill. Okay. We're voting to place 004255 onto House Bill 1005. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, no. Amendment added. You're recognized, Chairman Todd. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, just a point of clarification for folks that may be watching at home. The bill that I ran last week that did not get voted on rent and carried over to this calendar is very, very similar to this. This particular piece of legislation, as, it, as they ended up in the same position in committee, is actually a better vehicle to do what we wanted to accomplish because it opens up more titles and chapters, and I'll explain that in just a second. What this bill does, uh, it, it helps to do a, a few, th few different things, four different things specifically. One, to comply with the civil right indicated within the Second Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, this bill removes the infringement of that civil right within our code by flipping the language currently found in our statutes. It removes the word offense in 1307A1 by deleting that section the actual, it removes that actual offense, but does not remove any current crimes, nor does it create any new crimes related to carrying a firearm, except for 18 to 20-year-olds. 
The second thing it does is exactly that. As we have been recently instructed numerous times by several courts, our restrictions on the civil rights of 18 to 20 year olds to keep and bear arms is unconstitutional. This bill corrects that throughout the code. The third piece, since the Constitution and numerous recent court decisions have reiterated our civil right to keep and bear arms and not simply pistols, this bill changes the word handgun to firearm throughout the code where that applies. And the last thing this bill does is to state the obvious in, in a way concerning immunity from civil liability related to posting a property with the placard, no firearms allowed. Under current state laws, a person or entity may post their property to prevent the presence of arms. This does not change that. Anybody with private property can still post their property, but the law states today that if you do not post and you have the ability to post, you have immunity from any civil liability related to anything related to that posting. The obvious that it does not state is that that immunity goes away if you do post. And so we're just clarifying that in code to say that for sure and to, to pretty much state the obvious. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll be glad to take any questions. Thank you, Chairman Todd. Any questions for Chairman Todd? All right, we've got three people that would like to uh, testify on this. If Elizabeth Stroker, Colonel Perry, and Ben Boitis would come down, we'll go out of session. And if you'll just make sure your little red microphone lights on and introduce yourself to the committee and the members and have at it. It's uh, three minutes, by the way. Elizabeth Stroker, Legislative Director for the Department of Safety and wanted to come here. I'm going to kind of go through our legal issues as well as our departmental issues with this piece of legislation. And Colonel Perry, are we here for any law enforcement or safety specific questions as well. Um, first up, this bill does completely delete the current constitutional carry law, which means that it is true constitutional carry for lack of a better phrase, but it would also delete the restrictions that this body put into place dealing with DUI offenders, stalking offenders, um, anyone who is considered mentally defective by a court, as well as any federal prohibitions, which are all being deleted since all of the constitutional carry is being deleted. So that's one of the concerns we have is those people would then still be allowed to carry as that is being deleted from the code. Second up is the general change from firearms to handguns throughout the entire code. First, uh, our current permits say handguns as you all know, whether it be concealed or enhanced. So does that mean we then have to go back and reissue or change, we're gonna have to change the wording on all of those permits? You're gonna have permits out there that say enhanced, concealed, and now firearms. That's probably gonna cause some confusion throughout the state as well as in other states. So just a thing that we wanted to bring up. Um, additionally, it is deleting the code where the defense to carry in your vehicle is a defense to carrying with the intent to go arm. But in doing that, it takes away an employer's ability from preventing an employee from carrying in an employer's vehicle. There are a lot of state employees as well as private employees who would probably like to keep that right specifically whenever it is their vehicle that they are leasing or letting their employee borrow. Um, lastly, I'll touch on the fact that just simply changing everything in the code from handgun to firearm is a safety concern from the Department of Safety which is the main reason why we are opposed to the bill, is we prefer that it stay handgun. Um, and changing it down to 18, as Chairman Todd said, is actually something we would be comfortable with. As one of the previous bills we've seen was drafted, that is something we are currently working on through pending litigation. Uh, so if it were just that piece, changing it down to 18 for the enhanced, the concealed, and the constitutional carry, that's something the department would be okay with, um, but all of these other changes are what's bringing in all of our concerns. Thank you. Colonel, do you have anything? Thanks, Chairman. Colonel Matt Perry, I I'll just add a, a few. Uh, the, the safety concerns for law enforcement, so the, the idea of someone being able to carry uh, any kind of rifle or high capacity, uh, you know, rifles, um, is a concern for law enforcement, just our interactions with people, how do we address them? They walk in this building, we're, we're charged with protecting it, um, we can't prevent them from coming in, and, and how does law enforcement interact with people that are just openly carrying weapons? Um, they can't it, ask if they can carry. Yeah, and, and because of constitutional carry, we can't ask them 
who they are, what they're doing, why they have it. Uh, we just have to let it happen, and it makes us extremely reactionary. And in most cases, we are, if they are an ill intended, because we're, we're not talking about the honest, hardworking, good people of, of Tennessee carrying weapons. We're talking about the bad persons, the criminal element that have it. We will only be able to react to, um, you know, in most cases, we won't have firepower that matches their own. I'll stop talking. Thank you. Representative Parkinson, you're recognized. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, got a few questions. Uh, what what are the um, federal prohibitions that you mentioned that that this bill will run counter to? Ms. Stroker. So uh, currently under 1307G, that's the constitutional carry law, it, it says you can carry if you are 21 or 18 in certain situations unless, and there's about four or five things that you cannot constitutionally carry with, and one of those subdivisions is you are not prohibited under federal law. I, it, that could be covered elsewhere as far as purchasing, but with that being specifically removed as well as those others with stalking, DUI, adjudicated mental defective, all, since all of those exceptions to being allowed to constitutionally carry are being removed, then you would assume that they would then be allowed to carry in those situations now. Representative Parkinson. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I believe, just one second, I believe uh, Ms. Sonia may have a clarification. She, if, if she may interject, then I'll come right back to you. Elizabeth and Sonia Legal Services. So Section uh, 3917-1307-H is not deleted by the amendment, and that is the subsection that contains the prohibition on carrying if you have been convicted of stalking, um, a certain number of DUIs adjudicated as a mental defective or otherwise prohibited under federal law. So that's still in the in the code. Okay. Very good. Uh, Representative Parkinson, you're recognized. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the um, ch with changing of the uh, and I got a few questions, Mr. Chair, if you're okay with it. Uh, with changing of the uh, permits, is there a fiscal note that came with that with this bill? Ms. Stroker, you recognize uh, Yeah, I believe there is a fiscal note on it. I don't have it pulled up. I could definitely pull it up, but I'm not sure if they took that into account of it. Um, but it was just something that we came up with. And thank you, Elizabeth, for correcting me. I am very easily wrong, so I appreciate that. And I admit when I'm wrong, so thank you there. But I, I can pull up the fiscal note, or if someone on the committee has it, sure. be happy to. Representative Parkinson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and um, with with the age change, I, if I'm if I if I, my memory serves me correct, which my memory doesn't serve me correct very often, you you guys were opposed to going to 18 years old, if I'm not mistaken, last year, year before that. Why? What happened to change your mind this year, Ms. Strucker? Uh, there was a pending lawsuit that's been before the courts for the past couple years dealing with the subject matter, and the decision was made a few months ago that we would not be contesting that lawsuit, and we are under a pending current agreed order to lower that down or stop enforcing that age restriction. So due to the litigation and the pending order that's coming, that's why we are now moving to being comfortable with that based on what Chairman Todd stated earlier. Representative Parkinson, any follow-up? Yes, just the last question. Okay. Under, under this legislation, can if, if, if it becomes law, will a person be able to walk into the governor's office with an AK-47? Ms. Stroker? I'll let Colonel correct me if I'm wrong, but it is uh, you already cannot carry into the Capitol itself, so posting would still apply, so you would not be able to carry in places that are posted. No firearms. So no. Resident Parkinson. And thank, and thank you. And just to follow up on that, and, and so if it's posted, how does that affect liability in, in, regarding with this legislation? Okay. I, that may be a better question for the sponsor. It, it, we don't necessarily okay. deal with liability as okay. much. I, I, I'll hold that till, till we get back on the list. Right, thank good. you, sir. Thank sounds you. good. Who else have on the list? Anybody else on the list for Colonel Perry or Ms. Stroker? No. Representative Grills, you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Colonel, you said something about, you used the term the average person. Uh, like the average person, that's not someone you feared. So what's the difference between the average person and someone who is not average? Colonel. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Colonel Matt Perry, I, I don't know the answer. The, the person who, who has bad intentions, the person who is 
um, a, a criminal. We, 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 we don't know. We have no ability to, um, if someone is a convicted felon, uh, that they could walk in the building carrying a rifle and we, we can't, if we don't know they're a convicted felon, we don't walk around knowing most convicted felons. So that, that, that's really what I'm talking about. Most people are not going to um, do not have intentions or will not go and harm people, but it, it, it's those worst case scenarios that we're worried about. This is at Chairman Grills. I apologize. Uh, doesn't matter. Thank you, Chairman. Um, would you agree, though, that it would be beneficial for an individual to be able to defend themselves in case someone who was not the average person were to show up in a place of uh, just a common ground? So uh, their, them and their family aren't put at the mercy of a could-be perpetrator. Colonel Perry? Yes, sir. I, I believe someone should be able to, you know, like, uh, but but not necessarily with rifles and higher capacity weapons, you know, smaller handguns as, as they are now. Chairman Grills. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, a couple of years ago, the, uh, we had the uh, constitutional carry, which I think fantastic. I was a great fan of it. Uh, there were different weapons that were described in there that were called pistols. And the functionality of those weapons are the same as some of these long guns. Nothing changes. N uh, the magazine doesn't change. The functionality of it doesn't change, but yet there are apparently you guys don't feel that the average person should be able to um, handle those weapons without. I don't know what what it is y'all would like, but why? Why? What's changed there? Stroker. I I don't fully understand okay. the question. Okay. So. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. An AR-15 is is a gun that seems to get the bad rap. They're this long. They can be they can be shot in different capacities. You can also get an AR-15 pistol, which can be carried right now constitutionally without a permit. They're the same gun functionality. What's the difference then? Why why would you say that it's okay to carry this one without a permit, but we don't want the uh, the rest of the Tennesseans to be able to carry the long gun? Ms. Stroker. You. Yeah, I, I don't think someone should be able to carry either one. That's. Okay. Girls. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. But we have established over and over again through Supreme Court cases that the individual has a right to keep and bear arms for their, for their protection. And it's our job as legislators, in my opinion, to make sure that every Tennessean's constitutional rights are protected. And I took an oath to make sure that I did that. And I feel like voting for and pushing this legislation is something that I have to do from a constitutional perspective because I owe 6, 69,806 people back home that I plan on and tend to defend their right to keep and bear arms. Thank you. Safety you recognized. I, I would say that, yes, while it is a constitutional right, there is also plenty of case law as well as the recent Supreme Court decision that says it still can be regulated. Representative Grills. Any follow-up? All right. Any other questions for Chairman Todd and uh, Representative Beck? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and for safety. So, according to uh, uh, Representative Beck, is this for safety or do I need to go in? Safety. Okay. Carry on. Uh, in in reading the bill, this would allow any um, individual to carry an AK-47 out front of this building. Up and down Broadway, is that? Am I reading that correctly? Safety, you recognize? Yes, sir. Representative Beck. And since there's no uh, permitting, that y'all would have to, if you had an officer who wanted to question one of these people carrying a uh, automatic rifle, you would have to go up to those. Your officers would have to approach those people. Um, and you'd have to have probable cause to approach those people. Is that correct? Safety recognized. I, I think we'd at least have to have reasonable suspicion, but I don't believe carrying the weapon alone would be reasonable sus suspicion under this law and constitutional carry. Representative Beck. Typically, if one of your officers walks up to the guy outside uh, this this building carrying the AR, AK-15. AR-15. Safety recognized. Your, your officer has a, would be carrying a, a arm, a, a gun that is, is, he would be, your officer would more than likely be outgunned, correctly? Safety recognized. Yes, sir. 
Any follow-up purposes of vote? Thank you. All right, uh, Chairman Todd, do you have anything for safety or you're recognized? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I guess the first question I would have for you, you're here today, both of you here, to testify on behalf of whom today? Safety. Who do you represent? Safety recognized. The governor's office and the Department of Safety. Okay, so you're not Chairman here on your personal capacity. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So can you show me in statute or the Constitution of the t state of Tennessee where you as an administrative representative have the statutory or constitutional authority to come into this committee room in the legislature and oppose, which are your words, a bill that before this legislature? Safety recognized. We have the permission from the governor's office to come in and speak for the governor and his ad administrative agencies. Chairman Todd. That wasn't the question. Statutory or constitutional authority. You're a lawyer. I am a lawyer, but I do, know, do not know every single law that is on the books in Tennessee. Chairman Todd. And I would assert that you have no constitutional or statutory authority to come into this legislature as an administration representative to oppose bills. Safety recognized. I would direct that question to the governor's office and their legal counsel. Chairman Todd. They're sitting in front of me. You just said you represent the governor, so I assume you can speak for him. Safety. I, I, there's nothing I can say in this situation. I would have to agree. You mentioned, if, if I might, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Todd, you recognize. You mentioned the difficulties that this is going to present with the different permits that you have. We already have difficulties with permits. People have enhanced carry permits that don't say enhanced. Is that correct? Safety recognized. Uh, yes, that is correct, and that was a problem that we brought up back then when the bill was passed as well. Chairman Todd. So we already have difficulties with the public understanding what they have in their pocket, what's available to them, where they can carry, what's illegal, what's legal, very complicated code, and this helps to clarify that it's no longer an offense. You have a civil right to keep and bear arms, and it's not just pistols, Colonel. It's arms. As you well know, you took the same oath I did. So we all know what we're talking about here. And it may make people uncomfortable that somebody might see something that is different than what you're wearing, but it's still an arm. And our constitutional rights, our civil rights are that we have the ability and the right to keep and bear arms. And that's what this bill is about. And it's just, it's really appalling to me to have you guys come in here and represent the governor of this great state in the legislature, opposing legislation, it, it really is beyond the pale. Well, I think it's important to note that they're just doing what they're told to do and trying to keep us safe and safety recognized. Nothing I can add there. Like you said, we are doing our jobs and here saying our piece and how it would impact our department in the state, so. Any other questions for safety? And uh, Leader Lambeth, you're recognized. <laughs> Hey, Mr. Chairman, and, and Chairman, with all due respect, I was monitoring from the back room. Thank you all for your testimony today. Thank you for keeping us safe in this state. And I have said this in committee before publicly, and I will say it again. These folks are here doing their job. They're doing what they have been asked to come here to do. And they are giving testimony for us to consider in whatever way we choose. And then it's our vote. But if we have a specific issue with the message, we are welcome to take that up with the commissioner who has 40 plus years of law enforcement experience that these folks are here to represent or with the governor of the great state of Tennessee. We can absolutely have those questions. I left the governor's office just earlier today and I can assure you these individuals do speak for, for him to a certain point. They can't tell us every single thing that he is thinking at any moment, but they have a process. And I just wanted to thank you publicly, both of y'all, for the job you do. We, guess, we agree, we disagree sometimes, but I respect the job that you do. Thank you. Thank you, Leader. And uh, Representative Capley, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to make a comment to the committee, if that's okay. I wasn't going to direct. Do I need to wait for that? Or no, You're fine. Okay. Well, I just wanted to make sure the committee knows, and I'm sure several members up here already know, you can't exactly just go in anywhere and purchase an automatic firearm. There, there are several steps that you have to go through to purchase a weapon that, that would be classified under the automatic category. It's not like you can just go to Walmart 
and, and purchase a firearm all willy nilly as far as when regarding the automatic category. You, uh, I think there's a little bit of terminology that's being used in this committee as far as automatic versus semi automatic, AK 47, AR 50, whatever you want to say. It, it's not. It's not as easy as what it's being perceived to be. Thank you. And Chairman Todd, is it for the department or on the bill? Well, it's it's related to the conversation and, and Leader Lambert's comments, and I certainly respect his comments and understand that. But I did this just that. I have discussed this with the governor's office and was assured just yesterday that this department would not come in here and oppose or support a bill. They would strictly say how it affects their department. And that's not what has taken place here. So I have done that, sir, and I appreciate that comment. And uh, Representative Parkinson, is yours for the safety or is it for uh, the committee? Yes, sir. It was actually for my my, my, my junior colleague, uh, Representative Capley. Uh, so you know, could we go back into session since we're addressing the members? Sure. Anybody else for safety? All right, we're back in session. Hey, thank you all for safety for being here. We appreciate you. Keep up the good work. Chairman Parkinson, you're recognized. Thank, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and to my to my colleague. Uh, you know, uh, I respectfully disagree with you in regards to, you know, the where you can purchase automatic, and how you can purchase automatic weapons, because automatic weapons are pandemic in my community, and so there obviously are no rules to purchasing automatic weapons, you know, in, in my community. And, and and I would welcome you to come and, you know, hang out with me on a New Year's or a Fourth of July so you can hear the firepower that exists in, in 38128. And I'm talking about, I'm a Marine, so I, I know what a 50 cal sounds like. I know what it feels like when it hits you in the chest, the sound of it. And those those weapons exist in my community quite a bit. So I just want to share that with you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, and Representative Capley, you're recognized. Thank you for the response. I would probably venture to say that those weapons were purchased illegally, not not legally. That was kind of with, from the standpoint that I was saying. You cannot, it's not as easy to just breeze into a store and say, I would like that automatic weapon there. Uh, I'm going to pay cash, and we're going to roll out of here in five minutes. There's several steps that you have to go through to legally process paperwork and get a stamp, go through an FFL, I think it's an FFL. Legally purchased firearms and illegally obtained firearms are two different categories. Uh, it's much more difficult than what it's perceived to be. Representative Parkinson, you're recognized. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and, and thank you for the, uh, you know, because uh, I think that's part of the the challenge, you know, in, in, in this bill is that Law enforcement will not know who has legally purchased a weapon, who has illegally purchased a weapon, if it's an automatic or if it's semi-automatic, if it has been modified, if it has not been modified. But they will be faced with uh, dealing with, you know, whatever, you know, has come. And not to mention uh, the 18-year-olds or, you know, who have not been trained. And, and I know this has been been an argument, you, you know, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't given my first legal weapon and, and when I was in the Marine Corps until I was trained to be to know what to do with that weapon, when I can use it, when to use it, and how to use it. So, but thank you for that. And thank, and thank you, Mr. Sponsor, for the conversation. Appreciate it. Representative Kaplan, any follow-up? Any questions for Chairman Todd? Question. Question's been called. We're voting on House Bill 1005 to send to civil for All those in favor signify by saying aye. Opposed, no. The ayes prevail. Civil full. Next up, item number eight, one zero zero six by Representative Grills. Do we have a motion? And so we got a motion in a second. Representative Grills, you are recognized on ten oh six. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This uh, just removes the three hundred and fifty dollar bond in order to have a, a judicial hearing for a civil asset forfeiture. Question of the bill. Good bill. Question has been called. No objections. We're voting on sending House Bill 1006 to Civil Four. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes prevail. Yes, sir. Representative Parks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I may be out of order, point of personal privilege. I, but speaking of civil asset forfeiture, I thought I saw uh, our former colleague, uh, Representative Martin Daniels, in the building. Is he still in there? Did we lose him? He still is, right oh, there. There he is. is. If you make him feel welcome, good to see you. Thank you for Representative Daniels. 
All right, next up is item number 10, House Joint Resolution 8-0 by Chairman Todd. Do I have a motion? And we got a motion and a second. Chairman Todd, you're recognized on House Joint Resolution 80. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this resolution urges the Attorney General and Reporter to evaluate any newly passed federal statute, regulation, or executive order that may affect the rights of Tennesseans to bear arms and if such statute, regulation, or executive order infringes on that right to bring suit on behalf of the state of Tennessee to challenge any such infringement. Be glad to take any questions. Any questions for Chairman Todd? Uh, Chairman uh, Grills. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to commend uh, Chairman Todd for bringing this, but also brag on our Attorney General. Uh, General Scrimetti is just a fantastic individual, and uh, we ought to be privileged and grateful uh, to be Tennesseans and have him uh, representing us when it's time to go to court. Thank you, Chairman Todd. Any, or Chairman Grills, any other questions for Chairman Todd? Representative Beck. Is this, uh, Chairman Todd, is this your bill to lower the, the age from 21 to 18? Chairman Todd. Uh, no, sir, Representative Beck. We just voted on that one. Very sure. good. Thank you. Any other questions for Chairman Todd? Seeing none, we're voting on House Joint Resolution 80 to send the civil full. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, no. Ayes prevail. Civil full. Next up, item number 11, House Bill 578 by Representative Bricken. We got a motion and a second. Representative Bricken, you are recognized, and I'm showing three amendments. <laughs> the only one, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. The only amendment that we need to focus on, which makes the bill, is 4022. 4022. Do I have a motion and a second? We got a motion and a second. Then you said it makes the bill, so we'll vote on it. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, no. Amendment added. Representative Bricken, you are recognized on the bill as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. House Bill 575, I consider a public safety bill. This bill, as amended, simply removes a $100 application and processing fee for the enhanced handgun carry permit. By removing this fee, we'll be encouraging our citizens to take the department's approved handgun safety course. It will promote public safety as more citizens, hopefully, will be taking the course. And this bill sunsets January 1 of 27, so it's roughly, well, you can do the math, three years uh, bill. Now, an important point, over the last three years, and I think this is important for the committee to hear, the number of safety certificates, and I'll give you the numbers, and these are round numbers, for calendar year 2020, there was 87,000 certificates issued. Calendar year 21, 36,000. Cal last calendar year 22, 16,000. We've had an 81% decline in public, uh, in the enhanced certificate courses taken over the last three years. So the $100 fee, again, this comes from my local firearms range uh, owner, and he says we got to do something to turn to get citizens back to taking the full eight-hour course. I think this is certainly a step in the right direction by waiving the $100 uh, permit fee so citizens will take the course, get the enhanced license, and hopefully go ahead and get uh, the um, lifetime license. So anyway, that's the background for the bill. I'll take any questions. Thank you, Representative. And uh, Representative Parkinson, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative, for bringing this bill. I think it's a great bill. Um, and and, and I don't, I would, I'll would sign on to it, too, if it'll help. I don't want to sign on to it if it'll sink it now. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. <laughs> uh, but but why, why, are, why are the range owners wanting people to take the eight-hour course? Well, Representative Brinkin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. They certainly feel that the online course is certainly insufficient for someone that buys a handgun. To have the, the full course, to have range instruction, it's just critical uh, for our citizens that are gonna carry a handgun. 
Representative Parkinson. Thank, thank you, thank you for that, Representative. Uh, and, and I agree with you. I, uh, when I went to get my uh, enhanced care permit, I actually took my daughter, who was 11 years old at the time, and she sat through the class with me, and she she tested and everything. She actually passed the test. Um, and uh, but but it has been, when I say, um, absolutely imperative, you know, in regards to you know raising a child, you know, around firearms, and for her to understand, and she got a chance to shoot and everything in the range, and for her to understand and understand, know what that power that that weapon feels like, and know what kind of damage it can do, and know the safety concerns and stuff around it. I thought it was extremely helpful to my household. So I applaud what you're doing. Truly, truly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Brinkman, any follow up? Or? I, I, the sunset uh, provisions were put in there for two reasons. One, it reduces the fiscal note, hopefully, so we can get funding for it. Secondly, it will give a, us a period of time, hopefully, to see the results and hopefully the improvement in people taking the full eight hour course. Thank you. And Chairman Todd, you recognize? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, th does this in any way affect or draw down funds from the handgun reserve fund? Representative Brickin. I hope so. Um, and again, the funding of it is going to have to be figured out when it gets to finance, that if certainly the Department of Safety would stand forward and say, hey, we, we can handle this within our reserve funds, then I hopefully finance will, will get it out from behind the budget and and we can get this done. Chairman Todd. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I've had conversations with them even last year about this kind of thing. Um, as I understand, their reserve fund is, is between 20 and $30 million. It fluctuates some, but probably in the mid-20s, uh, which they admit, uh, have admitted to me that that is uh, more than is needed for a reserve fund. And their willingness, at least a year ago, their willingness uh, to draw down that fund to fund things like this. So I think that fund came from overcharging permit holders, for uh, just plain and simple. It, it's uh, They set fees and their costs are not as high, and so any excess goes to this reserve fund. And so it should go to, to the folks that are getting that uh, type of permit as well. So I applaud your efforts here and uh, to encourage people to get the enhanced permit and uh, obviously, if, if uh, my bill is successful, uh, that uh, uh, Chairman Grills and I are running, that uh, and we'll have more people wanting that uh, because it's going to be more broad than, than just handguns. But I appreciate you doing this. Thank you. Thank you. And not having any more questions, uh, Chairman Grills. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Chairman Farmer and I were discussing here. Well, just to make sure that uh, this is only for the state part of the uh, of the license fee, correct? This has nothing to do with the actual. Uh, course and the, the, the qualifying course that you have to take for the handgun safety. Representative Brickman. Yes, this uh, is the uh, only for the hundred dollar licensing fee. Um, I'm not sure if I heard you correctly, so uh, maybe clarify that question. Chairman Grills. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, it's my understanding, best from memory, that you have to take a course to, uh, of handgun training, hand, uh, firearm safety, and then after you complete that course, then you go and get your permit right and then at the then at that permit application you pay that fee to the state that is correct and this is only for the this is only for the permit fee that you would pay for the state correct well you know the hundred dollar fee goes to the state some of that fee goes back to the local sheriff's department and some of it goes back to I think the Department of um, I think it's safe to say you're asking TBI. to see if any money is being taken away from the person teaching the That's class. Uh, oh, it's none taken away from the uh, person taking the course. And the average course in for the eight-hour course, the from my instructor, he, they say they run from seventy-five to base, basically one hundred twenty-five dollars. So, the hundred dollars waiving fee would pretty much offset. The course fee. But it wouldn't take away from the instructors? No. Okay. All right. We're now voting on item number 11, House Bill 578, to send a civil for All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes prevail. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Thank committee. Thank you. All right. Item number 12 will be rolled one week. 
Next up, item number 13, House Bill 239 by Representative Bullzo. We got a motion and a second. Representative Bullzo, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, this is uh, an interesting bill. It seeks to provide uh, a definition for the word sex as used in the Tennessee Code. Uh, interestingly, uh, from the time that our state became part of the Union in 1796 until right now, uh, we have, as the General Assembly, used the term sex 275 times in the code. If you look at Title II all the way through Title 71, the term sex appears there 275 times. And what this bill does, uh, Mr. Chairman, is to clarify that when this body has used the term sex in the code over the years, it was referring to male, female, man, woman, boy, girl. Clarity is an essential characteristic of a statute, and both for judiciary purposes and for purposes of making sure that Tennesseans know how to act with regard to these statutes, it's important that a law be clear. And what this definition does is it essentially provides that the term sex, as used in the Tennessee Code, refers to one's biological sex as determined by anatomy and genetics as evidenced by one's birth certificates. So for those reasons, Mr. Chairman, we submit respectfully that this bill has substantial merit and should be passed by the committee. Thank you, Representative Bullzo. Any questions for Representative Bullzo before we have testimony? And Chairman Todd? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Representative Bullzo, I appreciate you bringing this legislation. It is one of those odd things that you would think possibly would have been defined somewhere in the past, but I would submit that it hasn't been because it was common sense. It was from, from the beginning of time, the beginning of the creation of man, that uh, it was understood. And uh, I appreciate you bringing this. Thank you. Representative Bowles, any follow-up? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Todd, I, I agree wholeheartedly. We, we do, unfortunately, live in a day and time where terms that have always been understood in one way are now being used in ways that historically and by convention they have never been used. And having a term, the definition of a term locked down in the code to give clarity to the judicial branch and to citizens we think is worth a significant merit. Thank you, and without objection, we'll go out of session and hear from Lynn Purvis. Lynn Purvis. And Ms. Purvis, if you'll just state your name for the record, make sure your red light's on and you'll have three minutes and you okay, can begin thank whenever you. you're ready. Thank you. My name is Lynn Purvis and I uh, live in Cannon County. The idea that doctors looking at babies' genitals or in rare cases, chromosomes, can make definitive conclusions about sex or gender is fundamentally flawed. There are at least 15 intersex conditions and according to Nature Magazine in 2018, as many as one in 100 people have differences or disorders of sex development, some of which mean that their genitalia cannot clearly be classified as male or female. In one out of every 1,000 births, doctors have surgically altered an infant's ambiguous genitals to match whichever sex was easier and expected the child to adapt. Frequently, they were wrong. A 2004 study tracked 14 genetically male children who were given female genitalia. Eight ended up identifying as male, and the surgical intervention caused them great distress. Now, the International Olympic Committee has struggled with this question on how to determine sex for decades. Genital exams were intrusive and humiliating. DNA tests checking for the presence of a Y chromosome were not reliable either. People with XY chromosomes can have female characteristics owing to conditions including an inability to respond to testosterone. Genetic combination can transfer Y chromosome genes to X chromosomes, resulting in people with XX chromosomes who have male characteristics. And certain medical conditions can raise women's testosterone levels to the typical male range. Um, I wanna talk about a field of study called epigenetics, which is looking at how, how, how genes are expressed based on a variety of molecular processes. A 2018 article in Gynecologic Oncology concluded that both sexual orientation and gender identity are biologic features conferred onto a fetus during pregnancy based on genetics, epigenetics, and a whole host of other biological factors. A small study reported in Frontiers of Neuroscience in 2021 looked specifically at the epigenetic function called DNA methylation, 
which helps determine which genes are turned on and off. This study found that transgender and cisgender people have different CPG methylation profiles that turned on and off genes related to sex and gender. These studies show that gender identity is an innate biological process, but not one that is easily summarized by a mere genital examination or simple chromosomal testing as doctors do at birth. So using national estimates for intersex and transgender populations, we have between 37,000 and 114,000 people here in Tennessee whose gender may deviate from what doctors assigned on their birth certificate and who will be harmed if this bill passes. When someone sees a gender marker on an ID that clearly doesn't line up with the person they see in front of them, people may choose to discriminate in housing or employment. A trans friend of mine told me of a time she was pulled over just for a traffic matter, and because her ID said male, because the state wouldn't let her change it at the time, police policy mandated... Ms. Purvis, that's your three minutes, but we got time for questions. Any questions for Ms. Purvis? Representative Bozo. Ms. Purvis, thank you very much for appearing here this afternoon and for your testimony. I have uh, one question and then a few follow-ups, if I could, Mr. Chairman. First, you agree and understand that the word sex is used hundreds of times in our Tennessee code, correct? Ms. Purvis? I do, and actually... Uh, hit your red... Yeah, yes, thank you. I do, and actually sometimes it's referring to male-female, sometimes it's referring to the sexual act of intercourse, so it's actually unclear in any direction. Representative Bozo, you recognize? Sure. Are you aware of any evidence, Ms. Purvis, to suggest that when the General Assembly has used the term sex in the code, that it was referring to something other than male, female, man, woman, boy, girl? Ms. Purvis? Can you repeat the question? Ms. Sure. Bozo? Sure. You've already told us correctly that the term sex appears hundreds of times from Title II through Title 71 of our Tennessee Code, correct? And my question simply is this. Are you aware of any evidence to suggest that when the General Assembly used that term in a statute, it intended to refer to something other than male, female, man, woman, or boy, girl? Ms. Uh, Purvis? What I am aware of is that in over 19 states, and including on the federal level, that they are using third genders, that it, it go beyond male and female to either be agender, non-binary, or un undisclosed. So uh, I believe that there are more than two genders, and our state should recognize that. Services Bozo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. That doesn't quite address my question. Let me, let me just approach it this way, Ms. Purvis. When I stop talking, I'd like you to list for me every piece of evidence you're aware of to suggest that when the General Assembly used the term sex in the Tennessee Code, it was referring to something other than male, female, man, woman, or boy, girl. Ms. What Ms. you're doing now is proposing a definition which has not existed in the Tennessee Code, so I can't imagine what they might have meant at that time, and what I believe at this time is that if we were to try to define sex, that it should not be written the way that you have written it, and that it should include the uh, reality that people are intersex and transgender. One, thank you, Mr. Chairman. One final question. Do you agree, Ms. Purvis, that it would be appropriate to de define the term sex in the code in accordance with the manner in which the General Assembly has used it over the years? Ms. Purvis? There are many terms in the Tennessee Code that are undefined. I was speaking on a bill last week about male and female impersonation, which has not been defined and has been left open for ambiguities. So I do not believe that if we are going to define a term at this point, that we should ignore the medical and uh, social realities of what sex means in this day and age if we are defining it today. Representative Bozo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Purvis. Thank you. And Representative Beck, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Ms. Purvis, for being here today. Uh, I was interested, first of all, what happened to your friend who was pulled over, who uh, her ID uh, said male, and then the, you were, your three minutes was up when you were talking about pulled over. What happened, ma'am, please, ma'am? Ms. Purvis, you recognize? Um, you know, it was a humiliating and, and physically violating experience that I would classify, you know, as harassment. She said that the police officer was aware of um, trans protocol, but by policy was forced to do this. She was able, 
uh, later to um, go to a state where she was able to change her ID. But what I understand of this bill is, is this will prevent people from being able to have an, an ID that matches their gender reality and instead will be locked down to what a doctor at the time using very basic visual techniques of genital um, examination uh, said as their gender. So I, I think that protection that she has right now of not being harassed because of uh, having a gender that um, is matched in her ID is going to be stripped back from her and many other Tennesseans in this state. Representative Bank. I was very interested in what you were talking about with uh, Intersect and the one out of a thousand. Uh, I noticed that in uh, House Bill 1 uh, that's, that's brought this year about um, uh, gender reassignment before you're 18, that it carves out a um, exclusion for those type of surgeries when you're when you're born, uh, if there is that the problem uh, with with the identification of the sex. And so, um, I, I uh, really appreciate you talking about that uh, for the committee to hear because. Sometimes things are just not black and white as they seem, and thank you very much. Ms. Purvis, would you like to follow up? Um, yes, thank you. I, I do have um, research, if anyone would like to see it, of um, they did a, a medical review of um, 40 years of the medical record at Brown University and came up with statistics for, like I said, over 15 different intersex conditions and their frequency that they occur. Um, and that's where some of these statistics are drawn for. I have um, all of this reports that I have cited, I can uh, make those available to anyone on the committee and we'll email them to you. Thank you. And not seeing anybody else on the list, Ms. Purvis, thank you. Uh, Representative Grills. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being here. Um, did I hear you say a while ago you think that there are more than two sexes? Ms. Purvis. Um, According to medical um, experts at this moment, they are reclassifying gender as a spectrum that, yes, has more than male and female. Chairman Grills. How many are there? Ms. Purvis? It, it is a spectrum, which as um, any other type of thing, that's not a concrete number. It's There is male on one side, female. Some people are not in the middle. Some people have mixed characteristics. Some people are born with XXY chromosomes. So I'm not sure how would you classify that. Chairman Grills. I feel that, that Chairman Todd referenced this early on. I know uh, over, in the, over in the Bible, I'm a, I'm a Christian, have a Christian worldview. And I feel that, that we're going down a road that seems to be an attack on the very character of God that God created man and woman. And every time that we try to, as society, move away from God, we're going in a direction that is not conducive, uh, well, not, not in the right direction, in my opinion. And I have a, a the, the district that I represent is, uh, feels the same way I do, at least the overwhelming amount of people that have reached out to me feel the same way that I do. But I feel like when we attack God, we're not going in the right direction. And the very nature of God is being attacked and I appreciate you, uh, Mr. Bulso, for bringing this. Ms. Purvis, would you like to follow up? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, I believe that God created every human being, and that includes every gender that is out there. Um, and I am here to represent people where I live and people like me. And I live in Cannon County. It's a rural county. And so I would just humbly ask you to take into account that I'm also representing people. And um, God has created all of these biological processes that I've just talked about. So I believe that you, we would be honoring God's creation by recognizing the diversity in gender. Thank you. And Representative Parkinson, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you for being here. So, you know, based on based on the studies, what actually determines sex? Or, 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 or and, and then another question is: Are we actually talking about the, the sex of a person? Or are we talking about the gender of a person? Ms. Purvis, um, both. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why there's intersex conditions and there's transgender conditions. Um, you know, what does go into sex? There are hormones, right? There is anatomy. There is external anatomy, there's internal anatomy. So a lot of these um, different situations that happen. So let's say your body produces testosterone, but you have a condition in which you cannot react to the testosterone. Your body will end up having what we would consider feminine characteristics. So I'm just saying that there are not... 
there are lots of different things going on in people's bodies that's not clearly this or that, and that's why allowing for a spectrum and then that person as they develop, as their different um, adrenal systems and hormonal systems develop, they will come to understand which direction, if any, that they um, feel most represents them. Thank you. Parkinson. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right, Representative Capley, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for coming before us today. Going back to the first part of your testimony, did you was it one in one thousand? Did I hear that correctly? Um, there Ms. are a lot Parvis. of different statistics, but yes, um, one in one thousand births result in a um, genital alteration ha surgery happening as an infant to okay. conform because the genitals weren't clearly seen as male or female, so they wanted to change them to make them look like more one than the other. So I don't, I don't have all the statistics and the numbers in front of me, but are you suggesting that this committee that is responsible for the decisions for 7 million Tennesseans make decisions based on 0.001% of the population? Is that? Ms. Purvis. Um, I'm saying that what I can tell is that there are up to 100 and, uh, excuse me, 14,000 people that this would be directly harming and I have seen no evidence for who if not passing this bill would be would be harming so in my idea doing nothing there's nothing that's I'm sorry I'm <laughs> having trouble explaining myself I'm saying no, I can fine. see clearly the hundred over hundred thousand people who would be negatively impacted mm -hmm. but I'm not sure who would benefit from this bill ever passing so I think knowing people that would be harmed by making an alteration and choosing a definition that excludes them and exposes them to harassment, violence, and discrimination over not making that cho choice is a clear benefit. Representative Kaplan. And, and I'm not being rude when I ask this. I'm just genuinely curious. Can you, what, is, what do you mean by being harmed? What is that? And I'm, I'm not, I don't have any kind of no. bias. I'm genuinely curious. What, what do you mean by that? Ms. Well, um, yes. Yeah, so if, you know, say I, you know, had an ID that, that said something different and I go to a bar, right, and, and people seeing that, there, we know that there's a lot of um, violence against transgender people right now. And so having to, even if somebody has, you know, appears as one gender but their ID says something else, when that gets, their privacy gets violated by having to show an ID at all the bars, airports, public places, that puts them in the hands of whoever might have a bias against transgender people to enact violence upon them. Um, Representative Kaplan. Uh, I'm still struggling with, with the violence and the harm perspective. It, are you just meaning in form of vocally or, or are you assuming that people would commit some kind of physical assault on someone who, who might identify? I, I'm just a little, I'm still confused. Ms. Purvis. Yes, I don't have all the statistics on um, violence against transgender people on me right now, but I, I would hope that you are aware that that is a problem, that there is a specific um, attacks on transgender people simply because they are transgender. Representative Kepley. I'm a little concerned that we're, we're moving away from, from the standard here, especially in, in the bill, it says evidence of a person's biological sex. And it seems that we're moving away from that and going toward this feeling aspect. And, and I'd like to propose an example to you, and I'm not going to ask you what your age is because I, you know, I, I don't want to do that. But I would assume that you are less than 80 years old. That would be my assumption. So my question to you would be, why are you not 80 years old? Ms. Purvis. Uh, <laughs> I was I was born in 1979. That's why. Okay, so biologically, you are not 80 years old. Ms. Purvis. Representative Kepley. All right, Representative Elders, you are recognized. All right, seeing no further question, Ms. Purvis, thank you so much thank for being so much. here. It's appreciated that you came down to speak. All right, we're going back in session, and Representative. All right, y'all are welcome to stay, but you're going to have to be quiet. Question's been called. All those in favor of sending House Bill 239 to Civil Four, signify by saying aye. Aye. No, sir. Signify by saying no. No. Eyes <laughs> prevail. Civil Four. I had to think about that for a second. Yeah. Seeing no further business without objection, we stand. Represent the Becky. We did. Thank you. I apologize.
Item number five, House Bill 985. I represent the Beck. We got a motion and a second. <laughs> represent the Beck, you are recognized. Thank you very much, and I'm glad the committee's sitting down because this is a cleanup bill. In uh, 2019, this committee passed a bill that uh, I sponsored to keep the information of minors uh, from being in court documents. Uh, uh, several judges have taken that to, to mean uh, parenting plans, uh, which was not the intention of the bill. But to clean up uh, the bill, we are making, we are specifically saying that uh, this bill does not apply to parenting plans. And with that explanation, I stand to take questions, or sit to take questions. The motion to roll one week and second is the proper motion. And second, all those in favor of rolling bill uh, 985 one week signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes prevail. Rolled one week. Seeing no further business without objection, we stand adjourned.